so thankful to be able to be with you again this evening, and it is a pleasure again to see so many visitors here with us. We've been blessed with visitors since this meeting started Sunday morning. We have visitors here tonight that uh, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to see you, at least this week, and I appreciate very much you coming out. I appreciate the wonderful song service, Stephen. He had led the singing for us at the Youth Lectures in Blue Springs last year and just did an outstanding job. We're looking forward uh, to that again this year. And uh, it just reminded me of that as I was uh, following his direction and singing this praise to God tonight. I'm so thankful for Stephen and, and for his good family. I've been able to get to know them better this week and appreciate the prayer on my behalf and on the church here and the effort we're making, Mark. I, I am thankful that you're able to be here and others, dear friends of mine from the Fort Worth area, uh, brethren, uh, I can't name them all. I will mention, though, uh, that my mom and my sister and my niece traveled from Oklahoma City to be here for the meeting tonight. And uh, I'd like that, to believe that that was because of the preaching, but I think it might have more to do with family. But I'm still glad to see them. And if you haven't met them, I hope that you get to. I'd love for you to meet my family. I want to ask you a question, though, as we begin our study, as I did Sunday morning, and I don't need you to answer out loud, but I would like for you to make a mental note or maybe write down on paper. And I'd like to begin by simply asking you, have you been saved? I think that's the most important question that we could ever ask anyone today. And it's the most important question that you could ever consider in your life. Have you been forgiven of your sins? And if you have been, I would like for you to just make a note of what you did in order to be saved. I like to ask people that question and, and, and because it's interesting that among people that uh, uh, call on the name of Christ or, or count themselves to be Christians, we can get a wide, varied number of answers to that particular question. What did you do in order to be saved? And I'd like for you to just make a note of that. And maybe uh, uh, your parents uh, had you at some special service uh, uh, to have uh, water sprinkled on you or some baptismal service when you were just an infant. Maybe after you were a teenager or later in life, you were attending a revival somewhere. And at the end of the sermon, there was a, a call, an invitation to come forward and to accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior. And maybe you prayed there with that preacher at that time and asked God to forgive you of your sins on, Christ, uh, on Christ's behalf. Whatever it was that you did, I'd like to know. Maybe you uh, came forward at, at, at one service or maybe after a Bible study and, and you confessed your faith in Christ and you were baptized for the remission of sins. Whatever it was, I'd like for you to just make a note of that. Because I expect that whatever it was that you did, that you fully understood that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We certainly understand the necessity of calling on the name of the Lord because Romans 10 and verse 13 tells us that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And therefore, anyone who does not call on the name of the Lord or will not call on the name of the Lord will not be saved. So surely, whatever it was that you did, you called on the name of the Lord. What I want to do this evening is to examine what the Bible means by that statement, whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. And what I would ask of you this evening is as you follow along in this study with your Bible, I'd like for you to as objectively and as honestly as you can compare what the Bible says about that to what it was that you did. Because there's nothing more important than that we know that we followed the Lord's direction, that we've actually obeyed His gospel in our response to the sacrifice and the gift of His Son and of our Savior in order to call upon His name. And as you do that, I, I want to mention to you this evening that we're going to go through quite a number of passages of Scripture. And, I've, and I have been so encouraged by so many who have taken wonderful notes on these charts, and I've, I've heard a little frustration on and how I've gone a little too fast through a few of them. I want to tell you we're going to be going fast tonight. And we're going to be building, and we're going to be developing, and what I want you to realize is that all of these charts are here. I, I've left them here. They're, they're here on the computer. They can be printed. I can send them to you. I'll be happy to share them with you. So what I'd like for you to do, instead of getting frustrated with me on going a little too fast, I'd like for you to make sure that you've got a Bible. Maybe there's a passage and you want to just make a note of that passage and go back and look at it later. But I'd like for you to follow along and just make that comparison. What did you do in order to be saved? You know, when I ask that question of people, one of the most common answers that I get, at least in this area and where I grew up, 
is that a person put their trust in Jesus and accepted him into their heart as their personal Savior. Maybe they prayed to God for Christ's sake that he would forgive them of their sins. And so when I ask people, how did you call on the name of the Lord? I am most often told that they prayed or said a prayer to God in, in order to have their sins forgiven. You know, this is actually, I believe, the most popular or commonly held belief about calling on the name of the Lord in this part of the country, maybe even greater than that. As a matter of fact, in the first year of my preaching in Perryton, Texas, uh, a young man, as a matter of fact, it was Ken and Kathy's oldest son, uh, brought me a tract that someone had handed him there at the high school in Perryton, and they were handing out these religious tracts, and on that track, the question was asked, do you know for sure that you're going to be with God in heaven? And he said, Brett, someone gave me this track. He said, I've looked through it. I'd like for you to look at it. And I said, I'd be happy to. And the first thing I thought is, what a pertinent track. I mean, what a great question. Do you know for sure that you're going to be with God in heaven? And so as I flipped through the track, I began to notice and, and to see what was being taught in this. And it was this most commonly held concept of accepting Jesus into our heart as our personal Savior or calling on the name of the Lord by means of a prayer. I'd like for you to notice this, and, and I'm going to tell you right now that that is not what I believe the Bible teaches is necessary in order to call on the name of the Lord. And, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, Brett, why are you putting that tract up here if you don't agree with it? And I want you to understand that I'm, I'm not trying in any way to embarrass or, or to shame or, or to make fun of anything. What I want to do is to accurately represent what I believe the majority of people in this area believe or have done. I want you to understand that I'm not building a straw man. I'm trying to make sure I accurately represent that. And beyond that, I also want to say that, you know, the, what we call the golden rule. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said that whatever we would have men do unto us, do unto them likewise. I could only hope that every preacher in Louisville would take all the charts that I've preached this week and put them on their overhead on Sunday. I'd love that. I'd love for them to take all the tracks that you have in your rack here, if you still have a track rack, and hand them out to their members. As long as someone accurately represents what I teach, I'd love for them to share it with the congregation, and I intend to accurately represent what they teach. If I haven't, please make me aware of that. But I want you to notice, and I don't, we don't have time to look at every page in this, it, it, very good points are actually made in this. He talks about uh, a God uh, uh, saying, why should I let you into my heaven? And, and the fact that the best news of all is that Jesus died for our sins, that it's a free gift, it is not earned or deserved, and that man is a sinner, and because he can't save himself, we see the dual nature of God, that he's merciful and just. And he solved that dilemma in Jesus Christ, in dying for our sins. And I would say amen to all of that. And then it goes on and tells us that we must have faith, that we must have a saving faith that is not just a mental assent. And I would agree with that as well. But then as we get to the point about what we must do to call on the name of the Lord, the track says, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life? Because this is such an important matter, let's clarify. Just what this involves, it means, first that you, uh, uh, it means first of all that you transfer your trust from what you've been doing to what Christ has done for you on the cross. It means next that you receive the resurrected living Christ into your life as Savior. Revelation 3 and verse 20 is quoted here. I stand at the door and knock. And then he puts in brackets at the door of your life. If anyone, comes, uh, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. It means further that you receive Jesus Christ into your life as Lord. And certainly he must have authority over our life. I would not take issue with that. It means finally that you repent of your sins. And I would certainly agree with that. But then he says, as we look there, he said uh, on the chart before, which I went past it, and uh, still having this, there we go. He says, now if this is what you really want, you can go to God in prayer right where you are. You can receive his gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ right now. Romans 10, verse 10 and verse 13 is quoted, with the heart one believes into righteousness, with a mouth confession is made into salvation. And then verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he says, if you want to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, then call on him, asking him for this gift right now. Here's a suggested prayer. 
Lord Jesus Christ, I know I am a sinner and do not deserve eternal life. I believe you died and rose from the grave to purchase a place in heaven for me. Lord Jesus, come into my life, take control of my life, forgive my sins and save me. I repent of my sins and now place my trust in you for my salvation. I accept the free gift of eternal life. The writer of the tract then says, if this prayer is a sincere desire of your heart, look at what Jesus promises to those who believe in him. He quotes John 6, 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Then welcome to God's family. He says, if you've truly repented, forsaken, turned away from your sins, placed your trust in Jesus Christ's sacrificial death, and received the gift of eternal life. And remember, that was done by praying to God. In, in, uh, according to the tract, calling on the name of the Lord through a prayer. He says, you are now a child of God forever. That's a topic of another study. Welcome to the family of God. And John 1 and verse 12 is quoted here. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And then as he closes out the tract, he says, Today is your spiritual birthday. And he quotes John 1, 13, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I want you to notice he's pointing out here that in believing and confessing and repenting, and accepting Jesus into our heart, and then praying to God that in doing that, we are born of God. If, if that's not his point, I don't know what it would be for him to quote this passage here. And so, and when I say him, this is an organization, Evangelism Explosion, that puts out this tract, and so I, I realize this is not just one person that puts this together, but this is a generally held concept of calling on the name of the Lord. But is this what the Bible actually teaches? Many times we hear this referred to as the sinner's prayer. That a person must come before God in, in some form or fashion as a sinner and pray to God, receiving Jesus into their heart as their personal Savior. And in doing that, they're calling on the name of the Lord, and obviously they will then be born again as a result of their faith. What is it that causes people to believe these things? Obviously, we've seen a few passages quoted here. I want to look at a couple of those, and then I want to look at what the Bible says about calling on the name of the Lord. Does the Bible teach the concept of the sinner's prayer in order to be saved? One of the passages that was not quoted in this tract, but that is commonly uh, a reference, is in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 18. And I want you to notice there, and I want to begin reading in verse 9. We're going to end in verse 13, where we're going to find a text that is commonly referenced, but I want to begin in verse 9. In Luke chapter 18, and in verse 9, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Then in verse 13, the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. In verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Now someone might say, well, Brett, there it is. We have a sinner's prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. There's a sinner praying to God. And what was the result? Jesus said he went down to his house justified. Well, I want us to examine this particular text and see if Jesus is teaching us what an alien sinner, that's what we're looking at when I say alien, I don't mean a Martian. I'm talking about someone who's alien or outside of Christ. Someone who is foreign to Christ. Is he teaching us here what someone who is outside of Christ needs to do in order initially to be saved from their sins? First of all, I want us to go back to verse 9 and to notice the purpose of this parable. In Luke 18 and verse 9, he says that it was a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. As we begin reading, we see that this was not a parable to some to know what to do in order to be saved. This was a parable to some who trusted in themselves. The point of the parable and of this prayer is the recognition of the need of forgiveness. The Pharisee didn't have that recognition, and the tax collector did. 
And I want to tell you, until we have the recognition of the need of the forgiveness of sins, we won't go any further. That is absolutely crucial that we understand. The Jewish rulers believed that they, having sinned, could keep the law so good after that that they could make up for any sins committed. So they didn't believe they needed a Savior. They could save themselves. And Jesus is addressing that problem here, not to give us everything that must do, uh, that we must do in order to be saved, but helping us to understand that first and foremost, we must recognize our need for a Savior. But I want you to realize that it's not only that. We also see that this man, this tax collector, being a Jew, was already in a covenant relationship with God. You know, the, we see under the Jewish law that when a, a young man was uh, eight days old, he was circumcised, and at that point came into a covenant relationship with God. We're not talking about a person who's already in a covenant relationship with God. We're talking about someone who is outside of Christ. If we're talking about someone who's already been saved and in a covenant relationship with Christ, then 1 John 1, verse 7 and verse 9 tells us that we need to repent of our sins and acknowledge our sin in prayer to God. We're not denying that. But we're not asking what does a Christian need to do once he's sinned to be right with God again. We're asking what does a person need to do initially to become a Christian. I want you to also recognize that we don't even have the totality of this man's obedience anyway. The parable was not to tell us everything that that tax collector did, only to emphasize his recognition of the need of forgiveness. The law of Moses required that man, according to Leviticus 4, to go and offer a sacrifice. He had to in order to be forgiven. So if he went down to his house justified, he offered that sacrifice, not just the prayer. And then, finally, we're not even under the same law as this man anyway. This was a Jew who was under the law of Moses, and we're not under that law. We're not Israelites. We weren't born under that law. And as a matter of fact, Colossians 2.14 says that that old law was taken away, having been nailed to the cross. We're under the law of Christ today. So this is not even a text that would give us the instruction on what a person must do in order to be saved under the covenant of Christ. You say, well, all right, Brett, maybe Luke 18 does not teach the sinner's prayer for us today. But what about John chapter 1 and verse 12? Let's look at that. It's a very good question. John chapter 1 and in verse 12, I want you to notice John writes, in, beginning in verse 11, he came to his own, speaking about the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. Now verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The sentence doesn't end there. Look at verse 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you're taking notes, make sure that you note verse 11 through 13. If we're going to understand verse 12, we've got to understand verse 11 and verse 13. He's talking about being rejected by some, but being received by others. And so someone looks at this passage and says, all right, there's the example, Brett. All I need to do is to receive Jesus into my heart as my personal Savior, because as many as received him, to them he gave right to become children of God. I don't deny one bit that we have the authority to become children of God when we receive him. The question is, what does it mean to receive him? Now, I know that may, that may be something you've never even thought about. Well, what does it mean to receive him? I know what it means to receive him. Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't. Maybe your concept of receiving him is based on what you've heard a preacher say, but not necessarily heard the Bible say. Do you know this text is going to tell us exactly what it means to receive him? Let's look at it. As we look at this text, what we're noticing is he tells us to them, them who, as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were they? Who were they who received him? to those who believe in his name and who were born not of the flesh nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God so those who received him are those who believe in his name and are born of God what does it mean to receive him what does it mean to receive him it means to believe and to be born of God that's what this text is telling us as many as received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. So someone says, well, who are they? Who are the people that received Jesus? 
He says they are those who believe in his name and who are born of God. Now, we don't need to discuss what it means to believe. I think that we all understand that. I hope that we do. And if, if we don't, we can study that later. But here's the variable. It is not just those who believe in his name, but it is those who believe and who are born of God. What does it mean then to be born of God? What does it mean? I want to suggest to you it means to be born again or to be born of water and the Spirit. Stay right there in the book of John and turn just a few pages over to chapter 3. In John chapter 3, I want to begin reading in verse 3. In John 3 and in verse 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was confused. He asked Jesus, how can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus explains that he's not talking about physical birth. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And in verse 5, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's telling us that being born again is equivalent to being born of water and the Spirit. Two things equal to the same thing are equal to one another. And he says that being born again is what is necessary to enter the kingdom of God, and being born of water and the Spirit is necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And being born of water and the Spirit is an explanation of being born again so that Nicodemus was not confused. Now, surely we don't have to try to argue that being born of God in chapter 1 is the same as being born again in chapter 3. They're equivalent. Being born of God is to be born again. To be born again is being born of God. I don't know of any denominational preacher otherwise in this area that would argue that point. So what we've established so far is that to receive Jesus is to believe and to be born of water and the Spirit. The next question is, how do we do that? What well, to be born of water and the Spirit, let's look first of all at what it means to be born of the Spirit. To be born of the Spirit, let's turn over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and I want you to notice there, we're going to see something about it. And I want to suggest to you that being born of the Spirit is to be born or begotten by or through the Word of God. You know, the Word of God, we're told in Ephesians 6 and verse 17, is the sword of the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, that revealed the Word, the Gospel. It was the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or rather chapter 2 and verse 12, who by words revealed the gospel to the apostles and the holy prophets. And so when we look at being born of the Spirit, what we're going to notice is that sometimes we're told that we're born of the Spirit, and other times we're told that we're born through His Word. Look in James 1 and verse 18. James writes, of his own will, and, I, and we're reading from the New King James, as we have been in all these scriptures, of his own will he brought us forth. Of his own will he brought us forth. I want you to notice in the King James Version, he says, of his own will begat he us. This word in the Greek is a word that means that process of birth. And in this case, we're talking about our Father. Who, by which we are born, and he's talking about the Word in this particular context. He says, of his own will begat he us with or by the Word of truth. Last night we were talking about the fact that in the parable of the sower, the Word of God, according to Luke chapter 8 and about verse 14, the Word of God is the seed of the kingdom. And in any birth, and any birth, you have two parties. You have a father and you have a mother. They each have a role. They each have a part. And that father has the role of that seed of life in the birth by, by which we come forth. And here he's talking about the fact that by his own will begat he us. Jesus was born of a woman, but he was begotten of the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus get there? It wasn't Joseph. He was begotten of the Holy Spirit. I was begotten of my Father. And here he says, by God's will, that we spiritually are begotten by the seed of life in the sense of the word of truth. Look at what Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 22. He says, since you've purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Now notice verse 23. 
having been born again, not of corruptible, look at it, notice that, corruptible what? Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. He doesn't say seed a second time, but he doesn't need to. He says not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. Remember, we were talking about the fact that this is how we're begotten by that seed of life. He says you've been born again by incorruptible seed. What is that, Peter? He says it is through or by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Who can argue with that? I mean, this is the Holy Spirit giving us the instructions that we're looking for. And I want you to notice that while we examine a track to see what is commonly believed, right now, and what we're going to be doing the rest of this study, we're not going to turn to a human creed. We're not going to look at a human opinion. We're going to let the Bible be its own commentary. We're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. That's how we learn. That's how we dig deep. And I want to tell you that's exciting because the Holy Spirit is actually teaching us through what he has said throughout his word. And here he says that we are born again through the word of God. That's how we're born of the Spirit. So as we think about being born of water and the Spirit, we're born of the Spirit when the seed of truth, when we come to the realization that we're a sinner by means of the gospel. And by means of the gospel, we realize and learn about Jesus, our Savior, and our need to be obedient to his gospel when that truth is implanted in our heart, James chapter 1 and about verse 18, when that word is implanted in our heart, or that's actually about verse 20, and that heart is honest, it brings forth a response, a birth. That's what he's telling us. But what's the water? What is the water in the new birth? Jesus said, except you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. What is that water? I want to suggest to you that it is water baptism in his name. Now, I realize that there are many people that will say, no, 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 Brett, you don't understand. When he said you must be born of water and the Spirit, he's talking about a physical birth and a spiritual birth. When he says born of water, he's talking about the physical birth. You know, we talk about before a baby is born, the mother's water breaks. And so that's how we're born of water, and then, then we have a spiritual birth. I want to tell you that's not true. First of all, because Jesus said we must be born of water, and that's not water that you're talking about in the physical birth. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I don't even play one on TV, but I know we've had three kids, and that's not water. Now, there's probably some, some uh, very important terms that I don't know, maybe amniotic fluid or something like that. It's a bodily fluid, and it's not H2O. And I am certain that when the Holy Spirit says water, he knows what H2O is, and he knows what bodily fluid is. We see when Jesus hung on the cross, two different bodily fluids being spoken of, and they're not the same. When the Holy Spirit said that Jesus turned water to wine, can I be confident that that was actually water, or maybe was it grape juice? How do I know? I know because the Holy Spirit told me, and he knows the difference. So when he says that we must be born of water and the Spirit, he's talking about H2O. He's not talking about a bodily fluid, and he's not talking about the physical birth. He is talking about the birth, the spiritual birth that takes place in water baptism. And here's why I say that. You can read from, from beginning to end of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the only water you're going to read about in any way associated with the new birth, it's going to be water baptism. For instance, in Acts chapter 10 and in verse 47, Peter said and to Cornelius and his household, or he said to those with him, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Notice, forbid water. And in verse 48, Then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Ask him to stay a few days. Notice, water baptism in his name. Baptism in the name of the Lord is water baptism, and that's what we're going to find consistently throughout the Scriptures. But it's not just in Acts 10, 47. We see this in a number of other passages, like in Romans 6 and in verse 4. The, the, the Apostle Paul writes there, We were buried with him through baptism. Baptism in the name of the Lord is water baptism. We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, listen to what happens when we come up out of baptism. Even so, we should walk, how? In newness of life. 
There's the new birth. That's being born again. And notice how water baptism is associated with that new birth. And not only in Romans, look in Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3 in verse 26. I know your fingers are getting tired. But we're, we're, we're making, what we're doing is we're letting the Holy Spirit guide us down this pattern of sound words to understand what exactly is involved in the whole idea of being born again, which is receiving Him. In Galatians 3 and verse 26, he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now I want you to notice he's talking about how we become children of God. Galatians 3 is all about how we become children of God. I became a child of my mother and father when I was born of them. And when we become a child of God is when we are born of God. That's what we see in John 1 and verse 12. So here he's talking about how we become sons of God. And he says, you are sons of God through faith for. The word for here is not the same Greek word that's in Acts 2.38. This is the Greek word gar. It assigns a reason for something. It doesn't mean into or unto. It's telling us why. He says, you are because you were. You are what? You're sons of God. Because you were what? baptized into Christ my friends that is just as clear as it can be as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ you can't put on Christ without being baptized into Christ and he's saying that we're children of God for or because we put on Christ in baptism that's how we become children of God. See how baptism is associated with becoming God's child or being born of God with the new birth? So as we're looking at John chapter 1 and verse 12, there is no doubt that he says that if we just receive him, if we receive him, we have the authority to become children of God. The problem is we have to understand how we receive him. And what we've noticed according to what we've looked at in God's word those who receive him are those who believe and are born of God. Those who are born of God are those who are born again. Those who are born again are those who are born of water and the Spirit. Those who are born of water are those who are baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins. So what does it mean? To receive Jesus means to believe and to be baptized. That's according to the text. We didn't go anywhere else. We stayed right here in the New Testament we looked at the context. We didn't take anything out of context. We applied every uh, 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 aspect of this text. And he says that as many as received him, he gives the right to become children of God. And by the way, receiving him is to believe and be baptized. Wow, that sounds a lot like Mark 16, verse 16 to me, doesn't it to you? He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I love this passage, but it does not teach the sinner's prayer. It does not teach to just accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior. And I am not in any way demeaning accepting Jesus as our Lord. We must do that. But there is a concept that it is more of an emotional attachment than it is of an obedience. And he's telling us here that there is something that we must do, conjunction with our faith, and that is baptism. So what does it really mean to call on the name of the Lord? You know, the psalmist in the 145th Psalm and in verse 18 said, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Isn't that interesting? That implies that there's a false way to call on the Lord. And that's why it's so important for us that we make sure that if we have called on the name of the Lord, that we have done so in truth. So let's look at this phrase, calling on the name of the Lord. What exactly does that mean? I completely understand why many people would believe that calling on the name of the Lord is done by way of a prayer. Because we have in our English language the word call. And when I think of call and when you think of call, generally we think about some verbal message. Something that is actually said. So I completely understand why just hearing those words might lead us to assume that calling on the name of the Lord is done verbally. But that's not necessarily true. And I want you to see why. 
When we look at this phrase in the Greek, call upon is the translation of one Greek word, epikaleo. And this word epikaleo means to call upon, to invoke, to call upon for oneself and one's behalf, anyone as a helper, to appeal to one or make an appeal to. There's the important part. And we're going to follow that through this study. It means to make an appeal to. Now, you might be thinking, okay, you know, potato, potato. What's the difference in, in uh, saying a prayer and appealing to God in a prayer? Well, it doesn't say in a prayer. It just says it means to appeal to. And I want us to notice this as we go on. This word is actually translated this way a number of times. We see in Acts 2 and verse 21, Peter said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. There's epikaleo. But in Acts 25 and in verse 11, Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. That's a translation of epikaleo. Later in verse 12, you have appealed to Caesar, the same word. In verse 21 of verse 25, but when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, in, verse 25, in chapter 25 and verse 25, he himself had appealed to Augustus. What I want you to see is that the same word that's translated call upon is just as often or more so translated appealed to. So what does it mean? Well, I want you to notice so far we've established that calling on the name of the Lord means to invoke or appeal to God's authority, seeking his blessings, We'll see Abraham doing so. But in our case, we are seeking his blessing, specifically the forgiveness of sins. Now let's take this a step farther. If the Apostle Paul said to the Romans, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, we ought to be able to find some indication of what it means there. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, and I want you to notice there beginning in verse 13. In Romans chapter 10, we find the text of our study, and Paul's going to explain something about this. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. And I want you to note there, he says in verse 13, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he begins to reason backwards. And this is what's interesting about this text. Paul begins at the end. And then he goes back to show the necessity of certain things. And his whole point is going to be found down in verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which was to a large degree what we were looking at last night. But he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And he begins to speak about what a blessing it is for gospel preachers to carry the word throughout the land. And he talks about the fact that this is important because faith comes by hearing the word of God. But then he affirms that not all have, does he say not all have called on the name of the Lord? Look in verse 16. He doesn't put it that way. He says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Paul is a master at using synonyms throughout to give us a better understanding of what he's talking about. One time he says, call on the name of the Lord, and in verse 16 he says, obey the gospel. So I understand that calling on the name of the Lord is equivalent to obeying the gospel. That's powerful. But I want you to notice a parallel. We've already read here, and no one doubts what we read here, but what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Let's look at a parallel. Turn over to Mark chapter 16. We've already seen its likeness to John 1 and verse 12 and 13. But in Mark chapter 16, I want you to notice, begin in verse 15. In Mark chapter 16 and in verse 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved that is incredible the parallel and the likeness here in one account paul says that there must be a preacher to preach the gospel people to hear the gospel believe it and call on the name of the lord and if that happens they will be saved 
And Jesus says, there must be preachers to preach the gospel and people to hear it. And when they believe it and are baptized, they shall be saved. You know what is powerful? The phrase shall be saved in Romans 10, 13 is identical in the Greek to shall be saved in Mark 16, 16. We're looking at the same thing. Jesus doesn't talk out of both sides of his mouth. He doesn't say it one way here and another way here and mean two different things. Jesus is the one who revealed to Paul what he wrote in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. So when we see two things, as I said earlier, equal to the same thing, which is shall be saved, those two things are equal to another. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, we've already seen that receiving Jesus is to believe and to be baptized. And now we're seeing that calling on the name of the Lord is equivalent, the same as believing and being baptized. Remember, we're just staying true to what the Scripture's showing us. But not only here. You know, another time where we see this is in Paul's conversion. I mean, if Paul said to the Romans, whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved, we ought to be able to look at Paul's conversion. Surely he did it. He didn't tell them to do something he wouldn't do. So what did Paul do in order to call upon the name of the Lord? Look with me over in Acts chapter 9. Let's go back to the account of his conversion, at least this uh, uh, to the Acts 9 account for now, and then we'll look at some other details in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 9, as we read about Saul of Tarsus, he is on his way to Damascus, and he is going down to persecute Christians. But the Bible tells us that as he was on his way, something happened, and, and thus begins the path of his conversion. We see that, first of all, he saw a vision, a bright light. It was so bright in the middle of the day that it blinded him. And I want us to notice then, uh, as we see this, as he journeyed and came near Damascus, a light shone around him from heaven. And in verse 12, he saw a second vision. He saw a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he had received his sight. But that's not all. Saul heard the Lord speak directly to him in verse 4. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul spoke directly to the Lord. He said in verse 5, who are you, Lord? And in verse 6, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? But that's not all. He repented of his sins. He recognized that Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified, who he was fighting against was the Son of God and was truly the Lord that must be called upon. He said, what do you want me to do? He was fully aware of his sins. And in verse 9, the Bible tells us that he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Throughout the Bible, this kind of fasting in a context like this is evidence of godly sorrow, of repentance. We see the very same thing when Jonah went and preached in Nineveh. This is characteristic of a heart that is torn with guilt and with sorrow. And so we see that Paul, Saul in this, at this time, had seen a vision. He had heard the Lord, spoke directly to the Lord, obviously believed in Jesus. Who are you, Lord? He reveals, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And so he doesn't say, well, I'm not willing to accept that. He said, what do you want me to do, Lord? He acknowledged his faith in Jesus as Lord. Here's a man who saw a vision, heard the Lord, spoke directly to the Lord, believed in Jesus as Lord, and repented of his sins. And that's not all. In verse 11, when Jesus is speaking to Ananias, he said, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Not only was this man fasting, he was praying. Now, I want to challenge you on this. If we were to go around this community and to ask various preachers, just hypothetically, I know this person, they had this experience where they saw a vision, the Lord spoke to them. They tell me they spoke to the Lord, but they're a believer now. They believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. They've confessed that openly. They've repented of their sins, and they've been praying for three days. Is that person saved? Well, according to the tract, absolutely. And according to most preachers in this area, absolutely. 
But you know what's interesting from this account of conversion? Saul still wasn't saved. Because in verse 6, I want to remind you that the Lord said, Arise. Remember, Saul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Jesus didn't say, You just need to pray. He didn't say that. He said, Go into the city and it will be told what you must do. Must do. What they were talking about is Saul's forgiveness of sins. They were talking about how Saul might be forgiven of who he had been and what he had done. That's what Saul was talking about. That's what Jesus was talking about. And my point is this. At the point that Saul had done all of these things, including praying based on his faith and repentance, he still hadn't done what he must do. What was that? We've got to look at his account as he gives it in Acts chapter 22. Because in Acts 22, remember the Lord said, it will be told you there what you must do. We don't really find out everything he was told until we get to Acts 22. And when we go to Acts 22 and in verse 16, the Bible tells us that Ananias came in to him and said to him, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Word for word, what we find in Romans 10, 13 and in Acts 2, 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. He says, you need to arise and be baptized in order to wash away your sins and call on the name of the Lord. What is calling on the name of the Lord? Consistently, we have seen that it is baptism in the name of Christ. That's what Paul did. He's the one that told them they must call on the name of the Lord, and so certainly he would know. But that's not all. I want us to also notice that on the day of Pentecost, Peter quoted this same passage in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, I want you to notice in verse 21, Peter revealed God's promise through the prophet Joel when he said that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beginning in verse 22, Peter began to reveal to them that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact that Lord whom they with lawless hands had crucified. And God had testified and acknowledged him to be the Son of God by the many wonders and miracles that he worked, but primarily by the resurrection of the dead. And so then he made clear, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus, whom you crucified, has been made Lord in Christ, Savior. And so we see a question that is asked as a result of that in verse 37. After Peter makes crystal clear that David wasn't speaking about himself in a resurrection, he's speaking about Jesus, and we know that he was raised from the dead. There are eyewitnesses everywhere of this. And they were convicted of the fact that they had murdered the Son of God. Not only that, they believed Joel the prophet. They believed that whoever called on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They just didn't realize until now they had just murdered the Lord that they must call upon. And so in anguish, they asked Peter, verse 37, Men, brethren, what shall we do? What were they asking? Were they asking, what shall we do since we're already saved? Because a lot of my friends tell me that the answer that Peter gave in verse 38 is that Peter was telling them what they need to do because they're already saved. That doesn't make a lot of sense with what I just saw happen before that. The Bible tells me that when those people asked that question, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted of their sins. They wanted to know, Peter, you started this out by saying that whoever calls in the name of the Lord should be saved. We know now we just murdered him. Tell us, how do we call on him? What did Peter tell them? He wasn't telling them what to do because they had already been saved. He was telling them what to do in order to call on the name of the Lord. What did he tell them? He didn't tell them to accept Jesus into their heart as their personal Savior. Look at verse 38. Not a word about that. Peter didn't tell them to pray for salvation. Not a word of that in verse 38 or 39 or 40 or the rest of the chapter or anywhere else in your New Testament. Peter told them, verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, there the word means, in order to, the remission of your sins. This is absolutely clear. One more passage. 
as we confirm this. 1 Peter 3.21, and I have recognized some of these points for a number of years, but I remember a, a sermon that my father-in-law preached, and he brought out this point, and it was one of those epiphanies for me. I mean, 1 Peter 3.21 is a very clear passage of Scripture, but I'd never connected it to calling on the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to look at what he's telling us here. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and in verse 21, really beginning in verse 20, Peter is telling us about Noah and his family and how they were saved through water. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, that is a few, eight souls were saved through water. Now verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The King James says, baptism doth also now save us. Now, there's really no arguing with that, but, but I want you to realize he's talking about calling on the name of the Lord here. Because in this parenthetical statement, he explains why baptism saves us. And it is certainly through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, baptism is meaningless. And notice how he connects baptism with the resurrection of Christ, just like we saw in Romans 6, raised to walk in newness of life. Colossians 2, raised up together with him. Ephesians 2, raised up together with him. Did you know Ephesians 2 is all about baptism? A lot of people look at verse 8 and 9, and they forget to look at verses 1 through 7. And he tells us absolutely in verse 4, 5, and 6 that we're saved by grace when we're raised up together with him. And the only way we're raised up together with him, according to Romans 6 and Colossians 2, is in baptism. So I want you to notice here, he's explaining how baptism saves us in the parenthetical statement. And he says, it is not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not the outward washing of the Jewish customs and religion. But it is the answer of a good conscience toward God. What does that mean? An answer of a good conscience? This word answer is the Greek word eperotima. W. E. Vine says it is not, as in the King James Version, an answer. It was used by the Greeks in a legal sense as a demand or appeal. This word means an appeal. Baptism is therefore the ground of an appeal by a good conscience against wrongdoing. Art and Gingrich say about this word, it is a formal request, an appeal. An appeal to God for a clear conscience. How do we get a clear conscience? The forgiveness of sin. Now I want you to notice that as we look at this word, and let, and let me just full disclosure, the King James Version, when it says the answer of a good conscience, in our vernacular, that means nothing it's nonsensical to us because an answer is never used in that way today but in the English language when the King James Version was translated the word answer was used in a legal sense to mean to make an appeal but that's not the way it's used now so we get a bit confused reading the New King James or the King James Version I believe the New American Standard Version uses the word appeal here and so what he's saying is that baptism saves us, not because it is simply an outward washing of water, but because in baptism, we are making an appeal to God for the forgiveness of our sins. Baptism is an appeal toward what? The name of the Lord, the authority of God. What for? For the forgiveness of sins. That's why Ananias could say to Saul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord because that's exactly what baptism is it is an act of obedience that acknowledges and manifests an appeal to God for forgiveness that's what Colossians 2 says in verse 12 that when we're baptized it is an act of faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead I'm not being baptized because I trust in my own works we're not to be baptized because we have faith in water or in man's works. We're baptized, according to Colossians 2, because our faith is in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And I am saying, I am acknowledging to God, I'm appealing to God, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And if you have the power to raise Jesus from the grave, you have the power to raise me from the death of my sins and to make me a new person. 
It is a humble act of obedience. And here's the power of it. It goes completely against anything that we would think, that we would think would save us. But it is in perfect harmony with every shadow and type throughout the Old Testament, marching around the city of Jericho seven times. Seven times on the seventh day. Who would believe that would make walls fall down? Naaman, dipping seven times in the Jordan River. Who would believe that would make leprosy go away? It was so unbelievable that he almost failed to do it. But it was designed to show Naaman that it was not of his works. It was God. And therefore, baptism for us is to make clear that this is not our work, it is God's work, and yet we're showing him we believe you. We believe you. And I know for some you might be saying, well, Brett, I see it academically. I mean, as far as the letters on the page, that's what the Bible says, but how, how can baptism be an appeal? Because when I think of an appeal, I think about saying something. You know, if I'm going to make an appeal to somebody, I'm going to do it by saying something to them. I'm not sure about that, not always. I want to tell you, as a young boy growing up in my family, when I got in trouble with my dad, and I made an appeal to him not to get a whipping, <laughs> not to get punished for what I just did, I didn't say anything. I was the most obedient, submissive little boy you've ever seen, at least for a little while. Because that's the way that you appeal to his authority. If I started talking, I just got in deeper. You made your greatest appeal to his authority and his forgiveness by simply being submissive and obedient. And God's telling us the same thing. It's not that we don't ever say anything. Obviously, we confess our faith in Christ. But that appeal is primarily seen in an act of faith. I believe you raised Jesus, and I'm going to manifest that by being buried myself and raised up, knowing there's nothing in this water, nothing in my power, everything's in yours. But you said do it, I believe you. Whether we're talking about Gideon, or we're talking about Joshua, or we're talking about Noah, and, and countless examples of the Old Testament, the brazen serpent in the wilderness, and looking upon it again and again and again, God is showing us, do something. Do something that you understand you cannot glory in, but you know the result is of my grace, of my power, of my doing. That's what baptism is. And my friend, what we've seen in this study is that baptism in the name of the Lord is baptism that is authorized by Jesus. That's what the name of the Lord is. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by their authority. And that baptism in the name of the Lord is an appeal. And it's an appeal by way of faithful obedience. When he says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and I'm baptized, I am in essence without words saying, I believe you. I just did this. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Baptism in the name of the Lord is an act of faith in the working of God, not in the working of man. That's what we've been talking about from Colossians 2 and in verse 12. And baptism in the name of the Lord is based upon faith in the resurrection. Colossians 2.12, 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism doth also now save us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's all about our faith that God raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus is the Son of God. And we've learned that baptism in the name of the Lord is calling on the name of the Lord. Have you called on the name of the Lord? Now, you might be thinking at this point, well, Brett, uh, you know, I, I, I did write down and I did remember that what I did is I accepted Jesus into my heart and I, I did pretty much what you showed there on that tract and I prayed to Jesus, prayed to God for Christ's sake, you to forgive me of my sins. But okay, because I was baptized later, I was baptized sometime later. Well, I want you to notice, first of all, that if you prayed the sinner's prayer to be saved, there's not a scripture to uphold that. If you accepted Jesus into your heart in order to be saved, the Bible does not give us that, uh, uh, that, that condition if you believed, now this is important, if you believed that you were saved after believing and praying, and if you wrote down that you accepted Jesus into your heart and you prayed to God and you were saved at the point of faith, that's what you believe. That's the reason I asked you at the beginning of the study. Sometimes we need help being honest with ourselves. And if you believe you were saved at that point, 
You say, well, it's okay, though. I was baptized later. Well, I want you to notice something. If you believe that you were saved at the point of faith and praying, then you were not calling on the name of the Lord for forgiveness when you were baptized. You believed you were already saved. You've got to be honest with yourself. If you're not, this is going to be for nothing. Remember the 145th Psalm in verse 18? The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. If you, were, if you believed you were calling on the name of the Lord by believing and praying, that's not the way that God designed or directed or instructed that we call on him. Acts 22 and verse 16 says that we must call upon him when we're baptized. And so if you believed you were saved at the point of faith and praying, but you were baptized later, then when you were baptized, you were not calling on the name of the Lord. You were calling on men to see an outward sign of an inward grace. I bet you've heard that before. Because that's what I'm told by most of my friends that baptism is. An outward sign of an inward grace. You know what that means? That means baptism is merely calling on men to see what God already knows. That means that it is just a manifestation not to God, but a manifestation to men that I was already saved at the point of faith. That's what is taught in the denominations. And if you believed you were saved at the point of believing and praying, then you weren't calling on the name of the Lord, you were calling on men. And you did not have faith in the working of God to raise you from spiritual death and baptism when you were baptized because you believed you were already alive. And the only way that baptism in any way is going to be a new birth is if it is, in fact, an act of faith in the working of God to raise me from spiritual death. If I don't believe that, then all I did is get wet. You know, baptism is an immersion in water. And I would expect that most of us have been immersed countless times. I mean, maybe swimming down at the river or out in the lake somewhere. You know, we've been baptized many times. If you're just talking about being dunked, I had two older brothers. That happened a lot. But none of those times were, 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 could I say that I was baptized in the name of the Lord because I wasn't calling on the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of sins at that point. And if you believed that you were already saved before you were baptized, you weren't either. So all you did was get wet. And what that means is that you have not yet called on the name of the Lord. And only those who have, only those who have will be saved. What does that mean to you? Are you willing to come to terms with what the Bible says? Not, I've not in any way intended to be rude or, or to be harsh in any way, but I have wanted to be direct enough for you to understand this is what the Bible teaches and this is what is absolutely necessary for you to have a home in heaven with God. Are you ready? If you believe that you were saved at the point of believing and praying, then right now, you need to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins and for the first time in your life, call on the name of the Lord for forgiveness. You have that opportunity right now. We're pleading with you to come and do that. Won't you please do it as we stand and sing the invitation song?